Thank you very much, Thomas, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my purpose in giving this talk is, is uh, really to try to explain something that I never learned about in school, and I've struggled with my whole career, and I don't, e I don't know if, if a lot of you have even thought about this in depth, but when you develop a product, you naturally want to see that product being used, especially if you think it has value in some way. You know, we have a lot of health problems these days, obesity, people don't eat correctly. And if you develop a product that you think could be of some benefit to people's health, you naturally want to see it out there in the marketplace. Um, the problem is, is that here we are, we're developing lines or germplasm, and we're dealing with very small amounts of seed, and, and you know, we're not really trained in trying to get these things to the marketplace. We don't know who to work with, and, and we don't know how, if we're in the government for uh, your entire career, you don't really know how companies work. So how much time as a public government breeder should we be spending trying to get these things to the marketplace? We're scientists. How much time should we take away from science and devote to trying to get our materials used? You know, as, as a taxpayer, um, I'm interested in that my tax money going to support government scientists goes for products that can be of value. And sometimes, if you don't take the initiative to try to get these things in the marketplace, they're not going to get there. They're just going to, you know, sit on the shelf. There's just tons of material, tons of good research that's been done in the past that has never led to a product. So that's kind of what I want you to think of while I'm talking about our adventures in this commercialization arena. Okay, this isn't my project alone. This is large part Susan Duvick, who's sitting there in the red jacket and will be happy to answer any question. And Pam White, who is our, uh, I'm a breeder, Sue is um, a breeder, and she has an emphasis in laboratory valuation of materials. And Pam White has been our cooperator from the beginning, and Pam is a starch and oil chemist. And just so you, you recognize Sue, and just so you don't know who Pam is, that's her. So the outline of what I want to talk about, first of all, I want to talk about how we developed this germplasm, and then um, the publicity that we did and the patent that came out of it. Okay, through this whole process, there's a lot of dead ends, delays, everybody's got problems and we had our share. Um, now we feel we're intra, into an entrepreneurial spirit and renewal of our potential. Perhaps, you know, and I'm trying to be very cautious, I don't know if it's going to work, but a recognition of the value and maybe leading to new products that will eventually be a commercial product. Okay, so a little bit of background about corn oil. Corn is not an oil crop. Corn is an energy crop. So it's fed to animals and people for the carbohydrates. But um, corn has a germ, and 85% of the of the oil comes from the germ, well, no, the germ, I don't think that's put right. 85% of the germ is oil. Um, it's extracted in milling. Now, corn, you know, like 30% of, of the corn, maybe even more, I think these are old figures, 30% of the corn in Iowa goes to wet milling and probably a whole lot more to dry milling. And those lead to a lot of valuable products, starches and, and processed products and uh, ethanol. But the most valuable product is corn oil. 
Corn oil is valuable because it has good qualities for cooking and frying, but it's under a lot of pressure because there's a lot more healthier oils. Not only healthier oils like olive oil, but oils that have been bred to have a better composition of fatty acids. The structure of the oil, there's fatty acids and antioxidants, which both in various combinations lead to good health. Fatty acids are altered by genetics and environment, like most value-added traits. Um, but what we found by evaluating a lot of corn belt materials is that um, the fatty ac acid composition in standard breeding materials is actually quite limited. And so we went outside, we went to Trypsicum to find a better fatty acid profile. This is a gas chromatograph, and this is what Sue uses to evaluate the fatty acids. And it's done on individual kernels so that we can make a little bit faster progress in breeding. Corn oil is um, about 63% polyunsaturated fatty acids, which you've heard about, have good traits, um, good for your heart. 25% oleic acid, which you've all heard that olive oil is good for your heart. Olive oil has about 70% oleic acid and also about 12% saturated fatty acids. Um, saturated fatty acids, you've heard, are the bad fatty acids because they cause heart disease. Um, but there's new um, types of oil that people are looking for. Fatty acid um, with total saturated components of 6% of or less, which should reduce LDL cholesterol, that's the bad part of cholesterol, or increase monounsaturated fatty acids, 65% or more approaching olive oil, to increase um, oxidative stability. Um, if you, um, if you uh, have oxidative degradation, that can cause um, problems with um, with human health, because we've all heard of antioxidants, those prevent oxidative um, degeneration. And, and the better uh, stability you have, the better the oil. So, um, and that's mainly because of the presence of free radicals. Okay, um, we all know, too, that we need to decrease our intake of trans fatty acids. Those are really bad. They're worse than saturated fatty acids. And so if we found 30% or more of saturated fatty acids, possibly you could develop a solid margarine product without hydrogenation that um, generates the trans fatty acids. So what we did to increase the range of fatty acids, we went to Trypsicum. Thank you for watching the Agronomist podcast. YouTube limits video links to 10 minutes. You can watch this seminar in its entirety at the Department of Agronomy website, www.agron.iastate.edu.